Well, Shabbat Shalom, and thank you for joining us. This is Valley Beth Shalom, Torah study for a Shabbos morning. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein here in sunny California, where it's always raining. And here is my dear friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman in sunny South Florida, where it never rains. And, and never rains, and never rains. So never we're rain. delighted to be back together. Um, this last week, we celebrated the joyful holiday of Purim, but the holiday was colored, I think, by all of the events in the world about us, the tremendous turmoil that rocks the state of Israel these days. And our prayers are with all of the friends in Israel, hoping they find wisdom and strength to get through this terrible crisis. This morning, we open up a very important Torah reading in the middle of the, the end of the book of Exodus. The Torah reading is called Ki Tisa. It begins with a, with a census of the uh, of the priestly class, uh, and then turns to one of the most famous narratives in all of the Bible, the narrative of the golden calf. Now, truth be told, the narrative where it appears in the Torah is a little bit out of order because it talks about Moses going up to the mountain for 40 days, which happened two Torah portions ago. And it occurs in this place for a very, very specific reason, because the golden calf is the counter example to the Mishkan that Moses is building. Moses is building a shrine. He was commanded by God to build a shrine. In the middle of the shrine is a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. Well, in the middle of this story, Aaron is going to be imposed upon by the people of Israel to build a golden calf. They say to him, make us a God who will show us the way show us the God who took us out of Egypt. And Aaron complies. He makes this golden calf. Well, the golden calf, the golden ark. The ark is covered with two mythical creatures, the Kruvim, the calf is a mythical creature. The serious question has to do with whether what happens when religious symbols themselves become objects of our reverence instead of pointing to something beyond themselves. They cease to be symbols and they themselves become holy things to be defended and protected. Really interesting meditation on what happens to religious symbols. And the entire, the entire story is contained in a dialogue. When Aaron finishes the, the golden calf, he says to the people, tomorrow will be a day to Adonai. For Aaron, the golden calf is not God. The golden calf is a place where one can come to meet the God of the universe. But the people, the people look at that golden calf and they say, that's the God who took us out of Egypt. They elevate the symbol into the thing that the symbol is supposed to symbolize. The great mythologist Joseph Campbell talked about this phenomenon happening frequently in culture. It says it's like a hungry person walking into a restaurant and trying to eat the menu because you forget that the symbol is just a symbol of something that is transcendent, something bigger than us, something beyond us. And the symbol itself becomes holy. But symbols have a tremendous power in our lives. Let's at least recognize that. We're surrounded by symbols. We speak in symbolic languages. We embrace symbols. I wear a symbol on my finger to remind me of the sanctity of my relationship with my wife. I wear a kippah in my head to remind me that I am uh, in a place where God is present. Um, we rise when the Torah is taken out of the ark. It is a symbol of our people and our, our connection to God. Symbols really do matter. Symbols may not be the, the, the most precious thing, as the story talks about, but symbols really, really do matter. And in this Torah portion, we have a symbol. The symbol is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you all know that because you saw the movie with Harris and Ford, this golden box. But what's interesting is what was put inside the Ark of the Covenant? What was kept there? Now, think about that question for a minute. We have a box. When I was a little kid, we had, uh, my brothers and I, we had a, a treasure box. Each of us had a treasure box, a little cigar box that my grandfather gave us, each one of us. And the idea was that you put your treasures in that box and nobody was allowed to touch them. And the question as a kid was, you know, what do you put in that box? You know, so I got a 
pencil for an award in fifth grade. I put it in my treasure box. Uh, I have a baseball card that I treasure. You put it in the treasure box. I think all of us have something like that. Some set of artifacts which represent the most powerful values, the most powerful moments, mementos of those transformative moments of life. What did the ancient Israelites put into that box? And what did it mean? Mark, what did they put into that box? And what did it mean? Yeah, I think that's, first of all, it's a beautiful summary there. And it's exactly the, the spiritual problem that Kitisa presents us with it. Every religion faces uh, a symbol, something that points beyond itself. And an idol is something that doesn't point beyond itself. It requires that you worship it. Technically, it's a symbol and a sign, you know, symbol. So what, what, what is the symbolic nature of the Arana Kodesh, the, the Ark? Well, the answer is that first, the big answer is that people can't worship an invisible God. It's just too hard. There's that idolatrous piece of us. Maybe you could say it's the legacy of our early ancestors who, you know, worshiped mountains and rivers and rocks. But there's something in us that needs to see and touch and be in communication in some way with a thing that, that connects us to God. I remember when Flight 800 in New York went down and, you know, that crashed into the ocean off of Long Island. And Tom Hartman and I were asked by the governor to come out and do a prayer service for the surviving families. And what was fascinating and deeply moving was that we all gathered around on uh, the beach there, nearest to where the plane went down in the water. And after the prayer service, there were roses, everyone had a rose. And without anyone telling them anything, they all got up and they walked to the water. And they put the roses in the water. Because they wanted to touch something, the rose, that would touch something, the water, that would touch something, the bodies of the ones they loved. They needed that physical contact. And I've been fighting recently <laughs> with families who are doing cremations. It's over, Eddie. I mean, burials are over. Every, almost everyone's getting cremated now. And, and I ask, well, it's, it's not for the dead person, but where are you going to take the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren to touch a rock that touches the earth, that touches the casket, that touches the remains of your father, your mother? You're, you're, you're depriving them of, of a place. So I think the piece we have to first acknowledge is that people need to touch and they need things that they can touch. And that's the role of the golden calf and that's the role of the ark. But the difference and what makes the ark so transcendent is that the, the ark is a box, like you said about your treasure box. And according to Jewish tradition, it wasn't just the 10 commandments that were put in there. Everyone knows that. But there were several other items in there that most people don't know about. The first, is the broken pieces of the first commandments, the ones that Moses shattered when he came down and saw the calf. There's a phrase, write two new tablets as with the first and put them in the ark. So the rabbis say, as with the first, means put the first ones in the ark too. And they have a phrase, luchot v'shivrei luchot, shnei amunachim ba'aron. The two, the ark, the, the, the tablets and the broken pieces of the first tablets were both put in the ark. So we now know 
from our tradition that the Ten Commandments and the broken Ten Commandments are both in the ark. But there's more. There were two other items in the ark, and one was a container, a, a jar, a clay jar of a, filled with manna, what they ate in the desert that they gathered and 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 it was a magical food. And there was a, a container of manna in the ark. And also, when Aaron was having a fight about his authority, he brings his staff and his staff blossoms with almond blossoms. That staff, Aaron's staff, is also in the ark. So you got the staff, the manna, the Ten Commandments, and the broken Ten Commandments. And my interpretation of that is that the ark had everything we need, symbolically. First, the, the Ten Commandments, which are the symbol of our ethics. They aren't the symbol, they are our ethics. The second is the manna, which is hope, that even in your darkest days, when you're starving to death in the desert, there's something that will come and feed you. God will never abandon us. And the third is Aaron's staff, which even if we're not thrilled with animal sacrifice and an inherited priesthood, you need umpires to play any game, including the Jewish game. So the, the staff of Aaron represents authority. So someone has to be in charge of this game, and that's the priests or then eventually the rabbis. So it's hope, ethics, and authority. Those three things you can live for 4,000 years. I love this idea that the difference between the calf and the ark, because they're both made out of gold. Yeah. They both have mythical figures. They're both become centers, if not objects of worship. But the difference between a calf, which is a thing, and an ark, a box, which is a container. And the idea that the, that the holiest object in the community is a container, and that you put into that container mementos, objects, things which represent the, the core values of the community, the deepest needs of the community. That is a wonderful observation, Mark. That's really wonderful. Thanks. And then the thing I want to go back to is the Shivrei Luchot. Okay. Moses smashes the tablets. Remember, these are the tablets that God wrote. He's carrying down tablets from heaven. He's carrying down an autograph from God, right? At, he sees the golden calf and he smashes them because the people, he's angry. He's angry at the people. In one of the Midrashim, it's that the people don't deserve the law. He smashes them out of mercy because he knows that the law and the people will contradict and it'll destroy the people. That's another way to think about it. There's another beautiful Midrash that at that moment, all of God's handwriting, the letters flew back up into heaven. They didn't belong in our world because we're not ready for them. And what he found himself holding were two inert pieces of rock, and he couldn't hold the weight, so the rock smashed out. Of, the rock fell out of his arms, and they smashed. In any case, the broken tablets get saved. Just think about this for a second. You know that number one, we all have brokenness in our lives, and there's a tendency to put it aside. You know, hide it. Don't let anybody know. Don't acknowledge it. Don't let the world know. This people keeps its brokenness right at the heart of its existence. That brokenness is who we are, you know, and that we were forgiven. There's a second set of tablets which are whole, but this time these Moses wrote. The idea that we can be forgiven, you know, we're, that 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 the, the, even the worst sin. I mean, this is this is the sin of sins. In, in the presence of God on Mount Sinai with Moses and Aaron there, we built a golden idol and worshipped it. What could be a better sin than that one? And yet the symbol of that sin is carried with a sense of, well, we were forgiven for that. We did repentance and we started over again. We, we corrected that brokenness. So you carry the brokenness with us. 
because yeah. even the brokenness is holy at this point and the Amen. power to forgive and rebuild it's a wonderful symbol well it's wonderful what you just added to it and i i would add also on top of all this with it stir this into the mix uh, a little verse one of my favorite lines from hemingway um from the farewell to arms hemingway wrote the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places mm. the world breaks everyone so it's that humility that we're all going to get broken and it isn't just hemingway it was also the midrash who understood this i i checked it out and the midrash to vayikra rabba the leviticus midrash 7 2 we read if a person uses broken vessels it's considered an embarrassment but God seeks out broken vessels for his use. As it says, God is the healer of shattered hearts. Oh, that's wonderful. And isn't that, you know, if you, you wouldn't put, it's considered terrible if, you know, you have people over and you put dishes down in front of them With a and chip. they're all chipped and broken. That's yeah. not appropriate. Yeah. But that's exactly what God looks for. God looks for broken vessels. And then just think it through. We got our the, the greatest of all Jews was broken. He had a cleft palate. Moshe had a cleft palate, a Ral Spatayim. So he was broken. And if you look at the greatest theologic theologian of the modern world, you could say, I would defend this thesis. It was Franz Rosenzweig. And Rosenzweig wrote the Star of Redemption, his greatest work, when he had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He was broken. But certainly the greatest or one of the greatest composers of all time, Beethoven, was broken with his deafness in it, and he was able to transform it and transcend it. And so, I think there is a lesson in all of this that we need to embrace our brokenness. I think this is a particular problem for men who tend to try to look macho and whole and strong and self-sufficient. I'm sure women have the same thing, but I know it as a particularly male pathology of our culture. The idea that you would accept your brokenness, accept the parts in you that aren't whole yet and that you're working on, and that hopefully you'll get them whole, but that that's what's in the holiest of all spots, a broken thing. Yeah. So, so in four weeks, we're going to celebrate Pesach. So that's why you can watch the price of matzah rising, you know. Um, yes. I remember one of the most memorable Passovers I ever had when I was a graduate student in New York. Nina and I were living in a wonderful community of students, and we got invited to one person's Seder. And we got a memo, and the memo was, uh, we're going to do this right, wear traveling clothes, and bring a suitcase. And uh, put into the suitcase what you're taking out of Egypt. So we show up to this guy's apartment. He'd cleaned all the furniture out of the apartment. We all come with traveling clothes. He ever had to bring their passport. And it turns out that they set a table, but no chairs. You sat on your suitcase. So I, I made a mistake. I brought a hard Samsonite suitcase. But the most wonderful thing was that during the course of the dinner, at certain points in the course of our Seder, he asks people to open their suitcase and take out whatever they were bringing with them and describe it. And it was a very moving moment. The one woman had candlesticks that her mother had smuggled from Europe and somebody had a book that they cherished that a teacher had signed or had, had helped with. Everyone had an artifact. 
that represented moments in their lives and elements in their lives that meant so much to them, that shaped them and made them who they are. And I think that's what the Ark of the Covenant becomes and the, and the wonderful interpretation you've offered us. So the question, if you don't mind a little therapeutic question here, which is, okay, what would you put in your Ark? What, were, what artifacts, what objects would any of us keep with us, keep with us as on the journey of life that represents the highest of us, the best of us, and also the values that we embrace, the 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 things that we that we cherish and things we're committed to, things that are precious to us, and the moments of our brokenness that we overcame. These are the things that were kept in the ark. What do, what would we all put in our ark? That's the question that the Torah reading wants us all to right, ask. All right, let's do it. I, should. I love it. Start? I don't have one. I'm just thinking, but it, yeah, it's just do. such a beautiful question. Start, it's such a beautiful image that you offered us. Okay, I'll start with my suitcase. Then you you think of stuff for yours. I I am a I'm not a hoarder, thank God, but I am a collector of tchotchkes and stuff. But they aren't tchotchkes in the sense of you buy stuff and you. No, it's things in my life that I would put in my treasure box. They're very important to me, and they're all around me here in my office. And I have up there, I have my grandpa's uh, tefillin with the, the straps cut off that he gave me. And, and I have my mother's Scrabble set before she died. She gave me a Scrabble, and every day she played Scrabble, and with this one old set. And and I I took the bag of letters and I spelled out Rosalie, my mother's name, and it's up there. And I have that inside a box up there on my shelf. There is a check from the Star Discount Center, which was an Army, Navy work clothes place that my grandpa and grandma Greenberg in Wichita, Kansas ran. And that check reminds me of their roots. I have a little uh, wind-up doll. There was a, a, a store, a wonderful store in New York. I'm sure it's gone now. It was called The Last Wound-Up. And they sold wound up wind up toys. Mm. So this is a this is a I'll, I'll get it for you. I'll show you. Okay. All right. So here it is. Let me get it. This in focus here. <laughs> and you you wind it up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His arms go around. And around and around. And you can throw it down on the on the ground. And the arms go around and they no matter how you put it down, they they put it back up standing. So no matter how you knock it down, and it's called the survivor. And I have that, and that's very precious to me. I have my father designed a chess set that he had. He ran a prisoner of war camp in Paris with German prisoners at the end of the war. And he couldn't give them uh, knives or anything, but they were, many of them were artisans. And so he built lathes and uh, wood lathes and they, out of the wood lathe, they, they crafted a chess set that's extremely beautiful. And I have it here in my room. And every time I see it, I think of my father. And he was an architect and he used to use erasers. And there's two little eraser nubs that, that he has and that I have up there. So those are some of the things that are precious to me. And every time I see them, memories come back. And, and I feel what I guess everyone feels when they have something that they worship, which is they feel connected. Mm -hmm. Without the thing, I would just be what in German is called a Luftmensch, 
yeah. uh, a person suspended in the air. That's what sacred space does for us. It roots us and takes us out of the air. So that's what's in my box. What's and, in your box? And, and it opens this story. I mean, it, it yeah, yeah, what yeah. it does, none of these things are intrinsically valuable. No, none, no diamonds, no gold. They're all objects that represent moments of your past, moments of your history, the flow of your family life. And it locates you in the flow of time so that you feel like you belong and you can see where you've come from and you can even get an inkling of where you're going. And that's what these wonderful objects are all about. And I, I would have the same. I would have objects from my, well, what from would my you history. Have in your box? Well, you know, my parents spent time. My parents began their lives together as a couple in Israel. They made Aliyah early in the 1950s. Yeah, they were on kibbutz. They were on kibbutz. My dad was the baker on the kibbutz. And when they came back, they brought back a few tchotchkes. You know, remember the green copper things that came back from Israel? Well, we have a couple of them. None of them are terribly valuable, but they represent my parents' deep commitment to Israel, to the Jewish people, uh, to their social values, uh, you know, building a kibbutz, sharing life in that way. And that, that was how I was raised in that, in that environment. And those, so those couple of, I have a green menorah, green copper menorah that it has absolutely no value whatsoever. Not even a very good menorah, frankly, but it represents that element, that, that episode in my family life. It, it happened before I was born, but it sort of followed me through my life and reminds me that that's where I came from, that this is the, these are the values that, that root me in the world. Um, and a, yeah. few other, a few other, a couple of other objects like that, nothing of intrinsic value. But things yeah. that root us in the flow of time, that give us a sense that we are connected, um, and that we're that we're part of a larger drama, and they represent commitments, deep values. My parents have this amazing self-sacrificing value of helping the Jewish people survive, helping the Jewish people thrive, and seeing the state of Israel thrive. So that, those are the values. So I, I'll ask everyone at home as you're as you're thinking about this, what what do you put in your ark of remembrance? What do you put in your holy ark that you carry with you on the on the journeys of your life that give you a sense that you too are located where you're located in the flow of time, the flow of history, and what really really matters to you. Now th let's finish this conversation with just one last observation that this is a crisis that this whole um this whole episode of a golden calf comes as a crisis moses smashes the tablets god says to him i'm not going with you anymore i can't do this i can't be with you i can't be with this people and moses says something very interesting he says to god if you don't go with us then we don't move he says kill me i'd rather die here i'm not gonna take i'm not gonna take this people without you and then what happens amazingly is God gives up. God relents. Yeah. And I think that moment of divine relenting, God relenting, because Moses is used to kings who never apologize. Pharaoh never apologizes for anything. This is the world of absolute monarchy. And a God who says, okay, I changed my mind. Okay, I'll come with you. Okay, my love, my commitment to this people and its past or its it overcomes my rage at their disloyalty. And at that moment, Moses turns to God and asks an amazing question. He says, who are you? What kind of God are you? You're a God who forgives, a God who changes, a God whose love overcomes his rage. What kind of, and then there's this wonderful scene at the end, very mysterious where he says, you know, show me your essence, show me your glory, show me who you are, tell me who you are, God. And God says, you know, you can't see it, you're going to die, so I'll put you in a rock, I'll pass by, you'll see my back. That's the Torah's way of saying, I can't answer that question. What's the essence of God? And then you get the statement, Adonai, Adonai, Rachum Vechanun. God is a God of mercy and love and abounding in, in patience and kindness. This is a different kind of God than Moses was waiting for. He thought he was dealing with another absolute monarch who never changes his mind, who never apologizes, whose rage is the final word. And he ends up encountering a God of compassion, 
which just surprises him. And that idea that the God of the universe is a God of compassion is the ending statement of this Torah portion. Before we go back to the other story about how we build the Mishkan, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. That's how the Torah portion ends. So on that note, let's end this week with a God of compassion and pray that that God has compassion upon us. Mark, take good care. God bless you, Eddie. Enjoy all the wonderful things in your arc of remembrance and keep putting them in, right? My, uh, my granddaughter is visiting. So I'm watching this small child discover the world and she'll put things in her arc that I can't begin to imagine. So all I can do is imagine for that. You Have a very, sorry? Give her the menorah and then it'll go into another generation. I'll give her the menorah, right. Have a very good Shabbos, Mark. Take care. Shabbat Take shalom. Care.